Hello, this is just another recording for the Suffolk Jungian Circle. Um, for this month we're moving on to discuss the intuitive type personality, um, which will be the last of the four personality types that we've looked at month after month. Uh, but obviously this recording might be of interest to other people outside that group who are um, keen on Jungian philosophy as well. Now the intuitive type is the sort of um, fiery, imaginative type of personality. The one that Jung describes as comprehending and grasping the world through leaps of intuition. So whereas the thinking type can understand a situation and explain logically this bit of evidence, that bit of evidence, this leads to this, that leads to that, and then build up a pattern, build up a picture like um, Sherlock Holmes or somebody like that, piecing evidence together to recreate a pattern. What the intuitive person does is, is in a matter of seconds, leap from an initial glance at something to the conclusion without having any real idea of how they got from A to Z. They've just gone to the end point and said, ah, this is what's going on here. They couldn't break it down step by step for you the way a thinking type personality could because a process within their unconscious mind has jumped to the end result without them having conscious awareness of the step-by-step -step process to get there. Um, and majority of the time, they will tend to be correct in their intuitions. Not every single time, nobody is that perfect, but quite frequently their intuitions are spot on in how they grasp and assess a situation. So it's it's people who have those sorts of, um, what should we call them, flights of fancy, where they can go straight to a conclusion without any great detailed understanding of how they got there. They just know this is what they believe, this is what they understand and perceive in a situation. That could be meeting somebody for the first time and within 10 seconds having a very clear idea of their personality, what kind of an individual they are. It could be the um, slightly um, sleuth type situation of walking into a room looking at objects and, and, and what have you and immediately getting a sense of what happened in that room just before they arrived of you know again like the detective who puts together the evidence to understand what's gone on but as i say without that um, conscious awareness of how all the details are observing fit together they just sense the conclusion without understanding the, the steps involved in getting there now, in terms of the um, extrovert and introvert t versions of the same thing, Jung describes the introverted intuitive type as being very prone to mysticism, very prone to um, spiritual callings. Now, that could be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, pagan, Shinto, whatever else. It's not specific to any one form of spirituality. Rather, it's a, a um, intuitive grasp of big picture ideas and understandings. Um, what is the nature of the divine? What resides for us, awaits for us after death? Um, walking into a, uh, a beautiful glade and immediately feeling the numina, the spirit, the presence of the glade, not having any rational, practical explanation of it, but just knowing it's there, feeling it, sensing it, intuiting it and building a, a spiritual rapport with it on the basis of that intuition. As such, the introverted type tends to be very, well, inward, obviously, they're introverted, very quiet, very withdrawn. Um, contemplative is the word to go for. That their, their spirituality is very inwardly turned, like, like a, a monk or um, a, a mystic halfway up a mountain, someone who sits and reflects deeply on the meanings of life and maybe is turned to for counsel and advice and so on by other people but primarily lives a very quiet and reflective contemplative life. The extrovert intuitive is more, and I hesitate to use this word because it has negative baggage for a lot of people, but let's go for it anyway, zealous in their, their spiritual grasp, their vision, their, their mystical bent goes outwards into wanting to share it with other people, 
Now that could be in the way that Christians and Muslims and various other religions do of, of conversion, wanting to go out and convert other people to your way of, of viewing the world. But it, it could also be um, not so much conversion bent as a desire to help people, to um, share, as, as Christians often say, share the good news. Now, I think this could probably equally apply to someone who is atheist, kind of said mysticism and religion and so on, um, mentioned these ideas several times, but you could have someone who's got a very rationalist grasp of the world, devoid of anything spiritual or mystical, but they have a sense of purpose, that the world is here for a reason, life is here to achieve some particular goal, some particular purpose, um, evolution or, or, or whatever, and they want to share that knowledge with other people. They want to convert other people to their non-belief, in a sense, to, to spread the, the vision they have of what is true, what is right, what is proper, with other people, to, to engage at a community level with them. Now, that community level, um, I'll keep mentioned conversion several times, it could be a community based of people who already believe anyway. So no one is being converted to anything, it's pre-existing believers. But that wish to share the joy of a philosophy, to share the conviction of truth, of the world is a certain way and we're here for a certain purpose, to, to share that with other people, not necessarily to convince them of something they didn't believe, but to nonetheless share with them. That's the, the extroverted outgoing part. Um, now that could lead on the, the, the downside, the dark side, to someone who's quite fanatical, a bit glassy-eyed and relentless in their wish to, to beat other people over the head with their beliefs and get them to convert, get them to, to change their ways. Uh, and speaking of which, it could be, um, obviously you get you know, very... Um, intense um, ex-smokers or very intense vegans or very intense um, reformed drug addicts or whatever. People who are convinced that there is a better way to live life than the way a lot of other people live it and so that their wish to share might not be spiritual in the usual sense of you know, mysticism and gods and goddesses and so forth. It may be based on diet, it may be based on um, some sort of therapeutic approach to life which says drink and drugs and booze are unhealthy and clean living is the way to go. And maybe that kind of intensity, that kind of conviction of what is a true way to, to be, behave, a true way to be. And I wish to share that with other people, whether that is um, getting other people to go on the wagon or whether that's going along to an AA meeting and, and just, just sort of sharing the joy with people who are already on the wagon. Could go either way, but nonetheless that desire to share. Uh, but that, again, whether, whether someone is trying to convert you to Christianity or they're trying to convert you to veganism or they're trying to convert you to teetotalism, that can get a bit oppressive and relentless if they're very relentless in their convictions and so the, the 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 downside of this of excessive extroverted intuition is somebody who ironically lacks the sensitivity to read the body language of other people and realize when they're getting bored and fed up with being preached at but it keeps going on and on and on and on because they're so convinced that their, their vision of the world is the right one, that why wouldn't other people want to participate in it and share it? So it could become excessive. And the, 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 the dark side, the downside of excessive intuit, um, introverted intuition is somebody who's so withdrawn into themselves, so retreated up their own inner world that they pretty much lose contact with the real world around them, the, the external world. They, they no longer know quite how to talk to people about anything, quite how to engage in daily life. It's lost in this, uh, this sort of somewhat airy-fairy realm. And that could, I, I think we've mentioned in some of the other um, well online discussions, if not necessarily in the podcasts, that um, you, you do get the whole phenomena uh, in the modern world, and it goes back to Victorian times, 
of fandom of people who are um, not so much true believers in uh, a religion but are if we can put it like that true believers in a fictional universe they're, they're mad keen on game of thrones or doctor who or harry potter or you know, whatever it may be um and, and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread and they love being with other people who also adore their genre so that they can share the enthusiasm that they have but they'll also sometimes be quite relentless in sharing that enthusiasm with people who aren't remotely interested and that they kind of go on and on and on a bit so it can be the extroverted bit but also introverted in that they're so um, immersed in their fictional universe that they pay less and less and less attention to the actual universe uh, and become abstracted from it and, and find it too too boring too dreary too troublesome too whatever that they, they just no longer want to engage with humdrum everyday reality which whilst perfectly understandable i think at times is nonetheless not not a healthy thing in the long term and if you just want to have a you know immerse yourself for a few hours here a few hours there fair enough that's not an issue but if you've got somebody who's immersed themselves for three years solid in a, another version of reality and completely lost touch with actual reality for that three years then that clearly is getting rather problematic and, and detracting them from engaging with daily life and real life so there is that risk of retreatism with the overly introverted type the withdraw into a, a realm of imagination um, the positive expression would be someone who takes their imagination dreams up better ways for the, the world to be and then goes out there and tries to make it happen so that they're using their imagination to inform reality rather than retreat from reality that would be a more constructive um, expression of, of the process um, underdeveloped intuition someone who's got, who's got a very stunted intuitive side so they'd be very heavy on the sensation very light on intuition um, Jung himself says are very prone to psychosomatic disorders because they are um, so immersed in their body that their grasp of a wider reality which is kind of what intuition brings you is a grasp of the, of the bigger picture is is cut off and it starts to undermine their body it starts to um, like the the creature locked up in the cellar banging on the door demanding to be let out and, and causes problems so their their imagination imagines problems in their body imagines illnesses dreams up fictive disorders uh, uh, and hypochondriac worries um, rather than their imagination expressing itself in a, a happy joyful constructive fashion and I think maybe if if you had lived a little bit longer he might have spoken more about people um, with conspiracy, <laughs> sneezy dog, conspiracy theories uh, who again perhaps detachment from the physical world around them um, express their their highly imaginative nature with big big picture understandings of whatever their favorite conspiracy theory happens to be whether it's the idea that everyone in a position of authority is a, is a lizard from a different dimension or whether it's um, martians controlling everybody or, or whatever it might be um, that they descend into ever more fantastical paranoid expressions uh, and part of it is also perhaps a bit of a, a retreat um, because the world is perceived as a fearful place rather than as an exciting and imaginative and wonderful place it becomes a, a dimension filled with imagined threats rather than imagined opportunities and i'm not suggesting that every person who's got a touch of paranoia is imagining it um, as somebody or other once said and just because you're paranoid it doesn't mean they're not out to get you because clearly there, there are conspiracies and criminal conspiracies and so on that go on in the world they just tend to be very small scale rather than massive grandiose conspiracies um, 
so I, I'm not not trying to dismiss all concerns about uh, political corruption or whatever as purely fantastical. They're not. They're, obviously, it does political corruption absolutely goes on in the world, but people nonetheless, especially on the internet, feed into um, unhealthy chat rooms and so on that, that wind each other up and make each other more and more and more neurotic and afraid and panicked and um, often engaging in a rather weird form of narcissism of um, feeling I, I know the secret conspiracies going on and all you poor stupid sheep don't. Um, you're all gullible and dozy and, and you don't know what's going on in the world. I know, I know, me and my little gang, my cabal, we know what's really going on. Therefore, we are superior to you dozy, uninformed plonkers over there who don't know what's going on in the world. There's a, there's a bit of kind of ego, a bit of narcissism going on in there for for some people, at any rate. Not, not for everyone, but for some people. That can become quite unhealthy. Another expression that Jung talks about um, with intuition, both positive, um, sorry, um, outgoing, extrovert and introvert, is the idea of, of pattern recognition, a very quick, very, um, as I say, without the logical intellectual steps from A, a to Z, a, a leap to grasp patterns, which can manifest in career expressions. Jung says this is more common for the extrovert type, for the introvert type, but could go either way, I guess. Um, things like uh, playing the stock market and um, being a, a, an amateur or a professional gambler, someone you, you can look at... Um, racing forms and read into them you can look at stock market patterns and read into them and see where where um, you know this, this stock might go up that horse might win the next derby that um, football team might win the next match grasp what's likely to happen very very quickly not always be able to explain the ins and outs of how you reach those conclusions you just sense you feel you intuit that this is where it's going and you buy the stocks, you, you bet on the horse, you do whatever it is, and again, more often than not, win. Because people with, with this sort of intuitive pattern um, are usually very accurate in the way they read things, even if that half the time they haven't got a clue themselves how they read things. It's, it's just like this sort of sudden magical flash of understanding that that's what's going to happen next. Um, the intuitive types, the ones given, um, the introverted intuitive types, more given to mysticism, can also be given to things like prophetic dreams and being very good at reading crystal balls and tarot cards and, and so forth, um, acting as mediums and clairvoyance because they're very good at, again, picking up on patterns that are going on and being able to, oh, I, I, I sense so and so thing is going to happen. And frequently they're right. Now, the, the cynical might think more in terms of cold reading, uh, you know, looking at the fact that somebody um, has a wedding ring or whatever and then, and then saying something about that. Uh, that undoubtedly does go on. There are um, jaded readers and circus acts and, and, and stage acts and what have you who do rely heavily on just reading body language without any, anything mystical whatsoever about it. They're the ones who could explain to you the, the series of steps they're following to reach the conclusion that they attain. It's the, the more mystical end of the market that have no idea why they know that this um, man is going to meet the woman of his dreams next Thursday and have three kids and get a promotion at work. They don't know why they know that, they just know it. And they present the inf well. They might present the information accordingly. Some people choose to keep the information to themselves, of course, but they might well share that with others and, and pass it on down the line. Uh, so there, there is um, a, a kind of magical element for Jung within the intuitive personality type, even though it would include people who are very rationalistic, atheistic in other respects and who do not subscribe to mysticism, but nonetheless have these these great convictions about how the world is and how people ought to live their lives and, and um, leap to conclusions without understanding how they got there in the first place, because it's their unconscious is moving so rapidly, it circumvents the conscious mind at reaching an answer. So it 
can be mystical but isn't always mystical. Um, there, there's a, uh, a phrase within um, Irish poetry, which is early Irish poetry, which is sometimes translated as fire in the head. Occasionally it's translated as, as the head of fire with smoke. This idea of burning intensity and a sort of spiritual vision. And certainly amongst the um, Empedoclean school of ancient Greece, with the four elements, earth, air, fire and water, um, intuition and fire are the one two most closely allied to each other. Um, so the intuition is the fiery element, as it were. Um, all the way back to the days, and well, I say the days, I mean, you still do it today, can't you? But maybe more common in earlier centuries before electricity and, and um, gas mains and so on, when people had coal fires and log fires, the, the practice of pyromancy, the art of just sitting around a fire, or a candle even, let alone a fire, and allowing your mind to drift off and you start to see shapes and colours and, and imagery in the patterns of the fire. Um, like when Lucy meets Mr Tumnus and he's playing music in his house and she's drifting off watching the fireplace and seeing images appearing in the flames flickering before her. It's a human practice going back to the year dot. And I strongly suspect it's also the appeal of um, fun fairs and, and um, one-armed bandits and, and kind of the gambling machines you get in casinos and at the end of piers and so on. They have not um, all the, the noises, of course, but also lots of them have flashing coloured lights. And I think that is picking up on the, the sort of the hypnotic nature of fire that the pattern of lights and, and the different colours that come in flames the yellows the reds the blues and so on depending on what you're burning that it is entrancing we've spent umpty thousands and thousands and thousands of years since the discovery of fire staring into the flames and allowing our minds to drift and that's when intuition is most likely to come forward when we're most likely to suddenly grasp something or have an understanding of something or, or feel a presence, a spiritual presence or, or have a vision of the future, whatever it may be, when the mind is allowed to drift in that sort of semi-hypnotic state. And certainly that Irish poetry, when it talks about um, the fire in the head, that I think is, is very much what it's getting at, that, that idea of uh, um, a mind adrift in the realm of intuition blazing and burning with intensity there's also um, a, a folk tale fairy tale whatever you want to call it from irish myth of the leon um the fairy mistress uh, the fairy mistress is, is less fairy in the in the sense probably most people would imagine a fairy than it is more like a vampire if anything in that the Leonown Shi drains people of energy, but it does it in a very weird way. The Leonown Shi is drawn to creative types, artists, musicians, singers, and so forth, and it predates upon them, and it fills them up first with energy, and they have this, this intensity of uh, knocking out a hundred paintings or composing a dozen concerts or... or um, writing 15 novels they, they go into this, this creative frenzy and the the the, the she the leonown she eats up the energies that are coming off them feeds off their creative juices like a, like a, a muse but with a very dark edge because eventually the artist burns out they have this intense creative energy thrust and then at the end of it they are dead not metaphorically dead plain old-fashioned dead the, the, the spirit, the Leonown Shi, has sucked them dry of their creative juices and they've probably produced amazing work which will be famous forevermore, but they are dead in the process. And it's a warning about the intensity, the, the very nature of fire. It devours the coals, the, the logs, which give it existence until there is nothing left but cold ash. And that intensity can be very characteristic of the intuitive type that they have these, these manic bursts where they're incredibly creative and then by the end of it they are sunk in, in despair and depression and, and, and burnt out, listless for days, weeks, months, 
stretches of time before the energy comes back and it starts again. Uh, and for some creative types, some intuitive types, the the awful periods of exhaustion are worth the in, the the intensity of the creative periods. It's a price that they are willing to pay in order to get that thorough investment where nothing matters except the thing that they are creating. Everything else can go to hell in a handbasket except for the thing that they are creating, the painting, the music, the, the poetry, the novel, the whatever it may be. They are immersed in that zone of creativity. That moment of intensity. Um, I have made a podcast ages ago. Podcast? video recording, whatever you call it, vlog, um, about Jung's notion of participation mystique, which is partially to do with investment sometimes in people, but also investment in objects, Cr particularly things that you have a creative relationship with, the, the, the artist and their portrait, the sculptor and their statue, the embroiderer and their tapestry. The, the relationship between the creative and the created. Um, so I won't recap all of that because I I'm, um, might possibly add to it with a second part because um, it can link into some other interesting ideas. Obviously Jung was, was mad keen on, on mythology and legend and so on. Um, you get stories like the um, Jewish folk tales of the golem, which the, 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 the rabbi, the, the rabbi magician creates the golem out of mud and animates it and it comes to life but it has kind of taken a little bit of a spark of life from the magician to create it and there is this difficult relationship between the creator and the created just as there is in in the, the sort of um, what you might call the non-jewish version the gentile version of that story or in other words Frankenstein between um, the doctor and the monster that he invests himself in creating this this amazing being it all happens it comes to, to fruition and then he ends up wishing he hadn't hadn't made it at all and, and it turns upon him and it, well, he turns upon it as well of course uh, there are many authors Conan Doyle Agatha Christie who created fictional characters who made them fortunes and they churned out loads of books and, and whatnot about them and then eventually reached the point where they were sick to death of their own um, fictional creation and thought i never want to write another bloody story about so and so again um, but often the public demand another story about sherlock holmes another story about hercule poirot uh, and the author finds themselves trapped by the very thing that they have created, which is an element of the intuitive type that Jung does mention, that they do not like to be trapped. They do not like to be tied down. And they tend to panic at anything that smacks of um, restriction or commitment um, or imprisonment, kind of being like, uh, you know, forced into a contract, forced into a relationship, forced into something they don't want to be forced into. And so often they start things and then panic and run away before finishing them for fear that they will be trapped by the thing that they've started. That could be a love affair, that could be a job, it could be an artistic project, it could be whatever. Um, but the, the tendency to panic, and this is a, a, a significant weakness of the intuitive type, they are very, very creative on the positive side, but they are often um, so afraid of being trapped by their own creations that they jump ship without giving that creation a proper chance or whether maybe without even finishing the project they just sort of have a, a, a litter of half-assed half-started relationships um, paintings sculptures whatever half of this half of that half of something else and um, nothing ever gets finished and, and that's a a problem for the intuitive type but I realised I've, I've waffled on a fair amount already, so I think what I'll do is leave it there. Um, we can pick up on some of these ideas in the um, Jungian Circle discussion. And if anyone who is not a member of the Jungian Circle who's listening to this has questions or suggestions, feedback, commentary, whatever, um, by all means, leave a comment either on uh, the blog, 
or on the YouTube channel and I will endeavour to get back to you.